Hi, everyone. I think we are online right now. Um, I have the pleasure to welcome here the researcher Tinkan Ho to our master class of the ITA Unifest Operations Research Prog Program. Dr. Ho is a computer science at IBM Thomas J. Watson Research Center in the USA. She has many contributions to the fields of machine learning, data mining, and pa pattern recognition, being noted for introducing random decision forests and pioneering work in ensemble learning and data complexity analysis. She is a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and the International Association for Pattern Recognition. She will be lecturing on reflections on the quantitative foundations of AI and we are very grateful for your availability to present these lectures for us. So, Tim, please feel free to start whenever we, you want. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you, Anna, for the introduction. So, um, yeah, the class, uh, welcome to my lecture here. Uh, I cannot quite see you, but I really uh, enjoy this opportunity to talk to you. Um, so today, uh, what I intend to to cover is that uh, some reflections uh, that I call. Um, well, first, uh, let me make sure the other slides. Uh, you're seeing the slides, right? Okay, good. So today, yeah, I'm going to talk about a little bit of my personal reflections on what I call the quantitative foundations of AI. So AI or artificial intelligence. Uh, has uh, in recent years uh, become a very popular term that you hear a lot in the media, right? Or in everywhere, yeah, it could, uh, in conferences of uh, all, almost uh, all of the domains. Uh, and it's in the popular media or in, in many other uh, news that from, it, it can be a day that you don't hear anything um, that doesn't mention something about AI. So if you look hard enough. So now, um, what really is AI about? Um, so usually when we talk about intelligence, uh, we are talking about several dimensions. This could include like a reasoning, learning, perception, or linguistic intelligence, or, or ability to make and process languages, and also problem solving. So this is some of the traditional uh, areas that uh, people in AI have worked on. Now, obviously you also have heard about other ter related terms uh, like uh, machine learning, deep learning, and data science. Uh, so their relationships are, are, are somewhat like that. Yeah, Usually um, we would say that machine learning is like one part of uh, the whole study of artificial intelligence. And then uh, within machine learning, yeah, you also have this uh, specialized discipline called deep learning, which is a one particular family of methods that are used in machine learning. Yeah. Now, separate from that, there's also data science uh, that also covers uh, several of the conventional disciplines uh, that include mathematics, uh, include statistics, or, or, or quite a few others uh, related to data processing and management. So now, so these areas are, are, are heavily overlapping, as you can see, right? But um, if we look into the concept of AI itself, right? What do people want to achieve uh, when they start to conceive this concept of artificial intelligence? So for that, I would go back to one of these earliest uh, pioneers of AI, right? So Alan Turing. Yeah, at that time, he's uh, proposing such a scenario. So when do we know that computer has achieved intelligence, right? So he's uh, thinking of such a hypothetical test. So assuming that you have someone sitting outside of two rooms, uh, yeah, and then uh, behind the closed door of these two rooms, one, as a person yeah, who will be typing on this uh, teletyper, who will be communicating with this uh, external person. And then in another room, there sits a computer. So now this person, this tester, 
can type any question on his keyboard to ask whoever is behind the doors. If he cannot tell which answer comes from the real human, which answer comes from the computer, then at that time, he would believe that this computer has achieved a human level intelligence. So this is the so-called Turing test. Right? So now, now what in the real world have we really accomplished? So I guess uh, one of the uh, thing or the closest accomplishment that makes people think that we have accomplished some form of human-like intelligence could be one of these uh, IBM accomplishments, right? In more than 10 years ago, so the Watson team complete, competed on this uh, US uh, question answering game called Jeopardy. So in that case, uh, it's, it's actually, um, there's a champion uh, who has won many, many rounds. Uh, this is Mr. Ken Jennings uh, and then also Mr. Brad Rutter. So now Watson comes in as a computer and try to compete in this uh, game. And it turns out that it actually won. Um, so for a while, people are thinking that, wow, now this machine actually is uh, comparable to human, at least in the context of this game. Right? Now, does it mean that we have achieved uh, really a, a general AI? And I think by now many agree that this is, we are still very far from it, right? But this is just a one example of a way people try to compare between human and computers. But on the other hand, do we think that we really want to just to um, match up with human performance? We want to think twice about it. Because uh, think about in this and other area of technology, namely transportation, right? So if we are only talking about human capabilities, uh, it, we will be comparing to something like that, right? right? So in, in some countries, uh, you, you can have a, a human. Um, well, earlier, there will be animal, but later, some human actually can power this uh, pole cart. So that would be how how far human can go right, the speed well but then since then right when we develop machines uh, we have gone naturally way way better than human abilities so this is to say that we probably can aim farther right in terms of doing ai human abilities is not necessarily the limit so now what has been enabling us to go for these other, um, other uh, capabilities, uh, sometimes uh, even beyond, um, have a hope of going beyond human capabilities. We can think about what we have, right? Since, we, since the early days when, when we have this uh, Alan Turing's uh, hypothesis. Well, since then, we have uh, gone very far. Right? We have now a lot of data, yeah, big data, small data, all kinds of signals that we can collect on machines. And we can also have a very large uh, text corpora, like the big Wikipedia, or even we can talk about Common Core, or the entire volume of text uh, that people are posting on the World Wide Web. And then we also have a lot of non-text data, right? By that, we mean a lot of uh, machines, like a lot, all kinds of surveillance cameras and Internet of Things uh, devices. Uh, now we have IP cameras everywhere. Many of it in our homes, watching our doorsteps. Uh, and there are other more uh, expensive machinery, like all these robotic telescopes uh, or Earth observing satellites. There are a lot of devices continuously streaming data. Yeah, not only on the global scale, but also on very local scale. Right? Sometimes it could even be very small machines uh, watching into the inner workings of instruments or your car, right? There are tons of telemetry data that you can tap on. So then by the, from the onboard computer, watching over all kinds of components on in the machine. So data, right? Data and also um, technologies to index, uh, retrieve and process all this data. And then we also have the computing structure, right? Now we are talking about supercomputers uh, that are, a lot of them are miniaturized. And you have GPUs, uh, you, in some contexts you even have quantum, and we have a lot of cloud computing structures, infrastructures. Well, but 
But on top of all that, I think the most important thing here is that we have a lot of algorithms, smart algorithms to support learning and reasoning, and also for decision making and optimization. So this is what we want to talk about today, right? So, so I would say that operations research or the program that you are about to go into or start, right, is really a body of studies of such uh, methods and algorithms. So here is just a one view uh, by one author that I, I run into on the internet. Uh, he is a posting, um, posting operational researcher right in the center of many of these disciplines. Yeah, just look at the terms, right? I think many of you would run into these uh, individual methods uh, down the line when you start your program. But you can see that operations research is a very broad area right, that touches on many of these disciplines yeah, and include many of the subtopics. Now, the relationship of operations research to AI, yeah, I would say that it, it provides a layer of uh, algorithms to process the knowledge and information in a quantitative way. So here you can see there are several specific topics within operations research can link directly into the detailed methods of artificial intelligence. Yeah, yeah. of course, this is the view of only one author, right? Again, one, one, one specific author who wrote this article in a medium. But we, this is generally true, right, from what I have seen in the methods in machine learning. So then maybe we can also go into a few of these uh, details right, in machine learning. So we, as we said that machine learning is a very core part of AI. Um, it is the body of algorithms that we want to use to process data quantitatively or do numerical learning, right, so to speak. Now, if we dive into machine learning, right, broadly, we can think of it as um, roughly three kinds of algorithms. Um, this is a supervised learning and unsupervised learning and also a, an area known as reinforcement learning. And then here are some of the applications of each of these areas. Now, how is uh, operations research uh, enabling these uh, several type of methods? So in the following, I just would like to um, just mention a few of these examples. So talk about uh, machine learning, right? So there are two, two the first two kinds is what we call unsupervised learning and supervised learning. The difference is that uh, in unsupervised learning, we don't have a, a target class or target uh, variables or response variables. We just generally want to find natural groupings in the data. And then in supervised learning, we usually have a certain target label that we want to divide the data according to, like uh, two classes of shapes, right? for example, that would be supervised learning. Yeah. In fact, a lot of the algorithms that you heard about and in the, in, in the popular um, forums, that, that many of them are about supervised learning because this is the area of um, machine learning that has so far been uh, best developed, I would say. Yeah. People are still just, uh, well, there are algorithms certainly in unsupervised learning, but there is still a lot of work uh, to be made there. So now let's look into a few of these uh, algorithms. So this is one particular method to do unsupervised learning. Yeah, we call that this is the method about dividing data into natural groups. So in this case, I'm showing a specific method known as uh, expectation maximization. So in this case, uh, we assume that this data, right, there are just a generally a body of points here, but we assume that they came from three Gaussian distributions. Now the job of the algorithm is to try to define these uh, distributions uh, using the best set of parameters. And best in this case is that we want those uh, uh, models to be best fitting the data. And you can see that as this algorithm runs, right? You can see that gradually we are, we are adjusting the parameters of the distributions to, to match uh, 
the three groups of pawns, uh, red, green, and um, bluish purple here. So in, in, in the process, uh, they are performing an optimization uh, procedure. Um, and this is something that we will run into a lot in, in the context of uh, operations research study. Now here is another case of optimization. This is one method for supervised learning, uh, long as uh, support factor machines. Uh, so now what is the mathematical problem there? Uh, the problem is that now you have two classes of points and you want to draw a, a, a in, in this case, a line, right? Because this is just a two dimensional plane. You want to draw a line to divide up between these two points. So many of the lines here, like these several lines can all do a job, do a good job on these uh, two classes of points. But which one is the one that you really want? So in this method, yeah, the idea is that you want to find that particular plane that would maximize the margin. Yeah, what does it mean by the margin? So think about these two points, right? There is some, some enclosure or some domain uh, covering all of them. And then there are some points that are sitting right on the boundary of, of that domain. So in this case, if I put my line here, right, these two will be the points uh, sitting right at the edge of the enclosure. And these are the two that we call support vectors. Now the, 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 the method is set up as a constrained optimization problem. Now, and it, its form is looks like that you want to maximize uh, this quantity to divide by the by the norm of the wave vector and subject to this constraint. So you, you will learn more about what this means later, right? How do you write a form like that? But basically in, in words, right? This is saying that now I want to, uh, first I want to impose some conditions, right? I want a line, right? And I want um, a line such that all the points of the black class go to one side of the line. And then all the points of the white class go to the other side of the line. So this is my constraint. So this is what this constraint is saying. And then once you satisfy this constraint, so all these lines would satisfy the constraint. And I want this particular one that would maximize the margin that would be like about dividing the gap evenly, right? This is to say that if I go for the two points that are closest to the boundary, yeah, I want my plane to lie right in the middle. So this is what this would give us. So as you can see that this is a, a very uh, typical kind of a constrained optimization problem. Yeah, another example of the families of methods that you will study a lot in the operations uh, research program. Yeah, you can see linear programming and you can see integer programming and, and there are all kinds of variants of the method. But the basic idea is the same. Right? You define some condition that you want your, your decision to satisfy. And then you have a goal, you want to optimize that goal while your decision is within that uh, region of feasibility. So that's another example of an operations research method showing up in the context of machine learning and subsequently AI. Now here is another one, right? So decision trees, uh, this also um, uh, studied a lot in decision analysis. Uh, so basically you try to set up your decision as a collection of smaller decisions, right? Say, all right, here I, I want to decide whether I want to accept a job offer or not, right? So then you say, okay, I'll start with the biggest concern that will be my salary. And then if this is good, right? Then I will look for my next concern. Camille, is that uh, uh, short enough? Uh, and then, well, if it offers free coffee or not. So this is one, one, one decision tree. And here is another, right? Um, in this case, the decision is uh, like uh, for a, a, a banker who need to decide whether I would lend money to this uh, client who's uh, coming to apply for a loan. Now I want to look into his credit history. Again, here I, I look into one of these uh, parameters, right? Or features about this client. And then I will, secondly, I will look to another feature which is his income level. And then uh, subsequently I'll see whether his uh, ask is a big loan or a small loan, right? And then I will make my decision accordingly. Likewise, uh, this would also be 
be a very popular method for making decisions in machine learning, uh, which is known as decision trees. Yeah, and in in well in my in my hands, right? It also twisted to a more generalized form, known as a random decision forest. In which case, you actually use a whole collection of trees and then take some voting of their decisions to to reach the final results. So here's another example of an operations research technique. Now. Deep learning is also a term that you hear a lot in the context of AI, right? Most of the deep learning algorithms is also set up as an optimization problem. Now, what makes the deep learning so special? So in the early days uh, or in many of the other machine learning algorithms, right, your goal is to send the input into your algorithm. And then your goal is to get a good decision in the output. But what makes the deep learning so special is that we actually are paying attention to not only the results at the output layer, we are also looking into the intermediate layers. And in some cases, we actually want the, the, the ways and all these things are coming out in the inter, intermediate layers. They are even more useful than the output. So it is the attention to these intermediate layers uh, um, that would um, make the deep learning method uh, so powerful and, and so popular and also to, to, to so useful in many contexts. Now here, here I'm showing a computer vision problem. Right? So from the image, the first layer may be extracting some, uh, uh, some local features, right? like a tiny edge uh, along maybe the hairline or so. And then you have the next layer that will assemble this into a larger part of the face uh, and then in the higher layers or, or the, 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 the lower uh, later layers, you can actually see a global picture of the face in some way. So these are the intermediate representations. Now, how exactly are we adjusting for this? Uh, so this is what the method is uh, set up to do. So basically, we need to pick a certain loss function. This could be like a comparisons of the network output to the ground truth, right, to the true label. This could be an identity, could be some predefined classes, but you want to force your network to produce an output that is uh, closest to what you want. And then uh, any deviation from what you want, you call that a loss, right? And then there are many ways to define the loss. Now, once you compute the, the first round of loss, right, you would try to use a method known as uh, stochastic gradient descent to, to propagate back the error into the inner layers of the network and then to adjust the inner layer ways accordingly. And then you go, <laughs> you just do this again and again after many iterations that uh, you would eventually achieve the, a smaller error, right? So, and so it, this is to say this becomes another optimization problem. So your goal is to use these iterations to optimize your loss function. And in this case, uh, if the loss is defined as an error, so you want to minimize it. Now the kind of uh, optimization algorithm in this case, uh, it is usually uh, done by stochastic gradient descent, um, but this is not the only way, there are other ways. Now the general idea of the method is that you start with uh, a, some random point, right? Usually the network is initialized with some random ways. Uh, so that means your objective function, which is like the, the Z dimension here, the height of this function here, you start somewhere, right? And then you look for the steepest descent, like the fastest way to go down, right? Which is expressed by the gradient. And then and do on and on and on. So you find the quickest way to go to your minima. So this is another optimization uh, algorithm at work. Now I want to talk about yet another operations research tool in deep learning, which is actually I found quite fascinating. So this is a, an, it's like a, a, a simple setup of a game theory method. Now this, is, this kind of deep learning network is known as a generative uh, adversarial network or GANs. Uh, so the interesting thing is that this is set up as like a two competing parties. 
So you have uh, one version of the network or one arm of the network being the generator. It will just keep producing some samples. The samples could be like uh, phases, right? For example, if we are looking into a phase generation program. Now this generator, it by itself, it is a deep network. It will try to create a phases. And then, but yet you have another branch of the network which would serve as a classifier. The classifier will try to compare the phases uh, with something real, right? And it would try to say, oh no, your face is no good. It doesn't look like a real human face at all. So it's trying to detect the fake <laughs> phases, uh, trying to detect the wrong phases. And then uh, this generator is working trying hard to fool it, right, in some way, try to produce rays as close as, as to the real ones as possible. And this one will try to detect those that are not the real one. So when the two of them are trained together, they, they form a kind of competing relationship. And at the end, when they settle down and nobody can improve uh, any further, then you would eventually settle at the equilibrium. And that would be about the optimal solution for this problem. So this is a, a very typical setup of a, of a game theoretic method. Um, and of course, there are many others, but this is one, one uh, very typical example of two competing parties uh, uh, trying to do the best at each, each side. And then eventually you, you go to the minimum uh, or, the, or the equilibrium where, where both of them have accomplished their best. It's a very interesting setup of a learning algorithm. And you can actually find a lot of this uh, on, on the web, right? There are various demos programs. And you can see that some of them actually can uh, are, are quite accomplishing and getting something really well when they go, when they, when they are converging to their equilibrium. Now, game theory, yeah, fundamentally is the mathematics of conflicts, right? So. In the example before, we see that there are conflicting interests of the two branch networks. One trying to fool the other, the other trying to detect the fake. So, and but game theory in general is a study about this uh, this uh, multi-party two. It could be two-party game, or could be one party against a, a certain scenario, right? But it's generally a mathematics of conflicts. Talk about all these comp competitory competitory uh, situations. And you can find many of those uh, in many contexts. Now, when we talk about the games, right, one thing that, um, that one concept that is used a lot is the concept of states, because uh, you want to describe the, the world or the, the context that you're operating in using the concept of states. So what is a state, right? A state is a very general concept that you can use to des describe a certain situation. So these are two very simple state machines. Uh, so like a, a light switch is a state machine, right? Because there are only two states, either on or off. So if you flip it up, then it becomes on, or you, you flip it down, it becomes off. So there's a very, very simple state machine. But still, you see that there are, a, there are a finite set of possibilities and you can see there are actions that you can do and, and the actions will cause the transition between the states. It's similar if you go to a, a turn style, right? Like um, this entrance gaze or whatever. So it could be in, again, it could be in two possible positions. Uh, and then if you put a coin in and it will go unlocked it, and then you push through, right? Then it will go back to the locked position. And then uh, likewise, uh, and if you don't insert a coin, it <laughs> just uh, stay locked. Yeah. So these are simple state machines, but the concept of state, right, can be used to describe many other things. Right, you can talk about your day in life as some finite states, uh, um, and then you can talk about some complicated games. A lot of online games uh, you may have been playing a lot they all have a uh, different kind of states and different transitions. Now, with this concept of states, right? So we can talk about these uh, third families of methods uh, in machine learning, um, known as uh, reinforcement learning, right? These families of methods uh, rely a lot on modeling the world or the context that you're operating in 
using the concept of stays. And then, uh, then between the stays, you can have different actions. You take different actions. And then some actions would give you a certain reward. And some would give you penalty. Yeah. And then you can learn using those uh, feedback um, from the actions to the environment and then back to you as rewards or penalty. You can take all this together and gradually develop your policy or parameters of your policy and then learn to play a good game. Yeah, I think you, you also have uh, heard the news that machines can actually do, do, do very well these days, right, on some simple games. And they are relying on this so-called method of reinforcement learning. But think about that, right? There is operations research at the heart here. Right? We are talking about a game theoretic setup, and then a lot of them is uh, related to the mathematical principles uh, behind um, behind this uh, this way of uh, modeling the world. So this is uh, my my very um, very rough overview or drawing a few examples of machine learning, right? That depend a lot on the technologies or methods in operations research. Now, in this next half of the talk, I want to talk a little bit about my personal take on that, right? My, my personal journey in the pursuit of machine learning research and also the applications. So just tell a few story of some specific examples that I work on. So this is where I started. Yeah. When I was in graduate school, my advisor received a, a series of grants uh, from the United States Postal Service. So at that time, the Postal Service is uh, building up and, and employing very large uh, machines uh, like that to sort the mail, right? sort letters. Um, and they can do pretty well if the letter is uh, printed using, I mean, if the address on the envelope is uh, well printed yeah, in very clear fonts, machine printed fonts uh, with the zip code. Right? So for, for many of those letters, uh, these machines can read them very fast. They, they, they process it very, very, at a very high speed. It, it is actually fascinating to see them running. But however, yeah, in those times, right, there are still a lot of mails, uh, a lot of addresses that these machines cannot read. Now, what happened to those uh, envelopes that are rejected by that machine? Um, I want to play you a video at this point. Um, let me see if I can trigger my video. And that is uh, how that happened. So are you seeing the video now? Yeah. I hope you are, right? Because I see that you're playing on the channel. So look at that. This is a, a special kind of machine that the post office has been. So they employ a large army of uh, human processors. They, they sit there in this on this desk uh, many hours a day, basically their full shift. And the only job that they are doing is to read the zip code on the envelope and then type in the zippo on this uh, two-handed keyboard. And look at that, right? So this is what they are doing every day and many hours a day. And this is where I started. Right? So when I was uh, visiting the post office uh, mail sorting center, I actually feel quite Quite, quite heavy. Yeah, my heart is very heavy, right? So all these people, they are spending all this energy doing only this thing, just read the letters. And this is a lot of manual labor we are talking about, right? So I, I think these people are very dedicated to the job that they can endure such a monotonous job, right? But however, wouldn't that be nice, right? If we can build machines that can take over, that can replace this, uh, difficult and monotonous uh, labor, manual labor. Right? So, and this is where I started, right? So my, my task is to read those very poor quality word images that are printed on the envelopes. So this is a sample of them. You see, just on the word Dallas, you can see that how all these different ways that they are printed, right? 
and in many cases, uh, I see. I would challenge you if you can actually recognize it, right, right? As a human being, yeah, are you able to really read what is there in 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 this uh, in these sentences? Yeah, yeah. And that is uh, specifically my task, right? Taking in a word image, yeah, which could be very hard to read, and then among a list of choices. Uh, in the input lexicon, these are the possible cities, right? For example, city names or street names. Then I need to design an algorithm that would interpret this word image as a one of the words in this lexicon. And if I'm lucky, right, I'll get the correct word right at the top. Yeah, I need to make a few guesses because there are chances that I may not make it right. So I want to actually output a ranking instead of a single decision. But the goal is to try to get the good word at the top. So this is my, my first project into machine learning or pattern recognition. But one thing that I found interesting is that um, there are actually many ways to do this uh, task. You can think about all kinds of ways you can characterize this image, right? See, you can uh, count the pixels in, in a grid of uh, cells, or, or you can measure whether there are some vertical edges or horizontal edges or holes. So you can think about all kinds of methods to read this image. And there are so many possibilities that I eventually, I come, came into the design of um, many, many classifiers. So here I'm showing a table of uh, the decisions of only 10 classifiers. So what are the number here? The number here is the ranking of the correct word yeah, for this image uh, as given by this classifier. So why am I showing you this table? Because this table is actually, the, I would say, the start of my real research career here, right? So in the context of implementing and trying to implement the methods to solve this problem, there's many methods. I came into this a very stunning picture. Why is it so stunning? We call that, we say that we are talking about the rank of the correct word. So if I score a one for that image, I will be very good. And or say this classifier will be very good. So say this classifier is actually, um, doing very well for the first image, this classifier number two. So, so as uh, classifier number four and, and classifier number eight. And this one doesn't do at all, right? This one is very bad for this image. And then I just look at these 20 images and, and but look, the good ones are all over the place. There's no single classifier that can do consistently well for every image. This one is uh, pretty good for most of them, but still it has a lot of bad ones. And then again, this is a awful one, right? Classifier 9 is doing so poor for most of the images, except for two cases. It actually can score the good word in very high rank. So what is this telling me? So this is telling me that uh, we may not rely on a single expert right here we actually may need to bring into a whole collection of classifiers and find a way to make them do their best job for the specific case that they are capable of so that's the beginning of my my research pursuit on um, on multiple classifiers and from that on i continue on the other versions of these uh, so-called ensemble methods right how can I collect the decisions of different um, decision makers and make the best of them? Now, eventually I came to this extreme effort of uh, what if those are not experts at all, right? What if they just make these random guesses? Can we learn with the random guesses? So there I ran into this method of uh, the principle of stochastic discrimination um, by Professor Eugene Kleinberg and after a few years of collaboration, yeah, I, after I understood those uh, methods, I eventually came into an implementation of it, which later became um, the method of random decision forest. So this is how it happened. So now, 
in the context of all that, right? So when you talk about methods and um, algorithms, uh, I also think that maybe sometimes there are more than that, right? So why do I come to such a question? Because uh, after we develop all these different methods, I still see there are problems uh, that this method cannot solve, uh, no matter how much I, I push. So this is to say that um, how far can the machines go? Right? So remember that now we are talking about AI, and, and a lot of AI work is to try to automate the task of decision making. And we want to push those decision making to the machines. And, but the problem is that now, what kind of tasks can really be pushed to those machines, right? Remember that when we bring the machine power to transportation, we start very simple, right? So we, we start with uh, chains and cars, and now we are talking about more self-driving cars, or, and then obviously there are also more sophisticated vehicles that be more designing. And then uh, when we push automation to that, after a while, right, there is something that we we think that is operating so well that we we almost forgot that it is done, yeah, by 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 machines, right? We almost forgot that no, it's just trivial, like elevators, right? We we don't think of the time that we need a human anymore, right? We can have total trust to an elevator when we step in that box, that metal box, right, which would pull us down so many many meters up, yeah. And you don't give it a second thought these days. But are we so sure for these other possibilities, right? Like uh, maybe automatic chains, uh, you're still okay, right? You see a lot in these days in, in subways, in airport vehicles. But, but what about self-driving cars, right? You're pushing to the boundary. Now, and autopilots for planes, and <laughs> I think we, we, are, we are trusting that a lot, but there are still situations that we believe it's better to have the pilot in control. So the question behind this is that when is a problem risky, right? That we want to maintain some manual override. And when is a problem um, less risky and that we can safely delegate the task to the machines, right? So think about all this task, right? Sorting between good email or spam mail or detecting uh, objects uh, in a natural scene or self-driving cars, right? There are some are easier, some are harder. And then there are sometimes uh, even more subtle decisions that we have to make, right? Like this uh, stock trader, he need to decide right, second by second, should I buy, should I sell? And then uh, sometimes we run into situations like that in social settings. And also more importantly, there's a lot of problems in medical diagnosis and treatments that involve very complicated decision making. So what are these, uh, I mean, what, which of these tasks are easy, right? Which of these tasks are hard? Um, so which are easy enough that we can, we believe that machines can learn to do well. So this uh, brought me to the study of learnability, right? Um, or say that which problems, which decision problems are easy enough and learnable by machines? just from the data. So I think there will be, there will need to be another lecture for, for me to go into the details of all that. But yeah, basically the conclusion from the study is that we, for all this uh, decision making problems in the world, right, we actually can identify a certain spectrum. So some of them are terribly easy. So like uh, in this simple example, in the two dimension, you can see that they are cleanly, linearly separable and then with wide margins uh, between them. These are the very easy tasks. And then you could have a whole range of other possibilities until you reach cases where you can't tell. There's no way to learn from the data. So now the study of this uh, classification complexity became a, a, a long running theme. Um, like uh, with uh, with uh, Professor Anna, right? Is also a recent collaborator on that. Yeah. So this there still remains uh, many other interesting topics there. Now, one of the thing that could also contribute to the to the problem to a problem being hard to learn is that there could be intrinsic ambiguity in the classes. 
when you think about this shape, right, you could call that a, a one or you could call that a lowercase l. Right? You actually don't know and there's no way to tell unless you know what is uh, next to it, right? Um, now in this case, right, you may think that, oh yeah, there are two cleanly uh, identifiable classes of shapes. That is okay if this is an unsupervised learning problem. If I just ask you to find the groupings between them, but no particular target or label. But if I force you to try to make a decision on a target, which is like, um, which shell was picked by my left hand and which shell was picked by my right hand, so if you're just staring at this uh, collection of shapes, right? Well, you you know, right? There's no way to tell because the features are not sufficient for this particular discrimination. So, but in this context, there's a chance that we can tell if we know more about the, the context uh, around it. Now, here comes another situation which makes uh, some tasks uh, very hard to learn is that when you actually don't have enough data, right? So this is to say that the boundary you are looking for could be so ill-posted, right? When you don't have enough information. Now, in this case, right, both this uh, surface or, or, or curves right, or this, uh, this uh, set of lines can separate these two points, set of points uh, equally well. Now, and this is because you don't have enough points to constrain the location of the boundary, right? If you have more and more points, uh, you can imagine that the boundary can be better defined and then you will know right, which of these two are a better classifier for that. So this is the case with, um, with small data. So when you don't have enough data, right? So what we usually end up doing is that we want to borrow some structure from the domain expertise. So this uh, turns out to be very important. And there are many ways uh, you can borrow such a structure. So these are some of the ways that we tried. And, and we even went for the extreme that when there's no data, right? So, and this, uh, you could still do some form of learning. How? By modeling the domain. So these are just a few of my previous projects that involve some heavy domain modeling. Um, see, here is an OCL problem. Right? We try to use an image a defect model um, to see all kinds of variations. A perfect shape can show up after it is uh, digitized, right? after it's printed, scanned, and digitized. And you can use a statistical model to check all these uh, possible distortions. And then uh, here are some of the more <laughs> larger uh, modeling efforts. Uh, like um, here in this case, it's actually a fiber optics project that I spent many years on. And there are some cases you actually have to rely on those models because you will never have real world data for them. Why? Because uh, you could be simulating some non-existing scenario, right? some hypothetical scenario, especially for disasters, right? a huge uh, catastrophe. So you don't want data from those scenarios. <laughs> Better they never happen, but you still want to learn from something, right? learn, learn from some models of it. In that case, a uh, simulation um, using what you can, right? what the models that you know about is uh, probably the only way to go. So now I have uh, told you quite a few of my projects uh, from some development of my original word recognition projects, right? We talk about the ensemble methods, we talk about classification complexity. Now from the from the image recognition side, we talk about how we can leverage the domain to to simulate for the distortions. And then from that point on, we where well, I I went on to study other simulation projects that, that brought me into the bigger world of the Internet of uh, devices, right, or of um, of machines, robotics, and so. Now, in the last few minutes, I want to cover the other branch of my career, which is like, again, still going back to the same project. So this project, um, see, when we look at a single word, right, in isolation, usually it is very difficult without the context. But once we put that into the context of, uh, say, an address, right. 
like uh, if I know that uh, the city of the street, if I know the city name, right, first, if I know the city name, then it basically set a, um, a constraint on what kind of street names are available there, right? How many streets we, we usually know, right, within a city. Yeah, or we can also do that vice versa, right? If you know the street names, uh, perhaps this also constrain a little bit on the name of the city. So this is to say that if you leverage the context of the whole address, uh, you can derive uh, some information that can help you on the recognition task. Now, from this uh, point on, we study other ways of uh, using the context. Uh, so I just want to quickly go through a few examples again that I found very interesting. So this is an OCR task. So in the year 2000, uh, Professor George Nagy and I, we, after studying this topic for a while, right, we claimed that we can do OCR with not, without knowing any of the Curtis shapes. Now then a professor, a, a professional colleague of, of ours, uh, Dr. Larry Spitz, uh, at that time he was working with uh, Xerox. Uh, so he sent me this image, right? He said, okay, Tien, now read it, right? So now if you said you don't need to know the simple shape, now how about you read that for me? Well, really indeed, yeah, in a few minutes, um, I was able to decode this message and then uh, send him the original text. Now, how did we do that? So we do that now all by leveraging the context. Well, first, so we, we try to find the simple shapes, right? find the clusters. So which ones are, are similar to each other, right? Then we just assign a, a certain label to that, right? So if they appear here together, I just uh, use the same code for them. Now, once you do that, right, you essentially uh, have a whole uh, very um, interdependent uh, piece of text and then just by leveraging the context the relationship between these uh, labels and in this case we also use a dictionary which uh, also give you additional constraint and eventually you can decode what this text is about so this is one example of how we use the context now and more interesting story about context is uh, about natural language processing. This is uh, essentially what I have worked on for the last uh, seven or eight years. Now, I would say that natural language processing right, is uh, one way that we can look into the inner world that we build after we see the external world. So because uh, if we think about language, right, what it is, it is really a channel where we communicate thought, right? So someone has a thought in mind, right? He will encode that as, a, as an expression in a certain language. And then the receiver, when on hearing or reading that language, he's, have, he's going to have to decode that and then reproduce the thought that this other person was communicating. So remember that we talk about stay machines, right? So our mind can also be thought of as a stay machine, right? Although that's many, many, many states. And the natural language understanding is one way we can prop into those mental states, right? see what's going on and see how they evolve. Now, um, now natural language processing is uh, a lot about context. Uh, in fact, in the most recent revolution in NLP or natural language processing, we actually rely completely on context on defining the meaning of certain words um, by leveraging what is called a, the distributional hypothesis, right? The word itself, the a word is a, or the character, right? These are all man-made symbols. They have no meaning until we put them together uh, this is to say that their meaning is completely defined by the context. So in the last decades or so, right, we see a lot of very, very interesting progress. Um, a lot of them started with this uh, origin, uh, this, this uh, algorithm known as word to vector. Right? You can actually convert a word into vector using a certain kind of neural network setup. 
ray. And the nice thing about that is that once you convert them into this kind of vectors, you can actually process uh, arithmetics like that. Right? So the meaning of king, if you take away the meaning of man and then add back the meaning of a woman, you can actually get back the vector for the word queen. So you can actually perform some mathematics using these vectors. So this was about the beginning of the latest uh, revolution of NLP. And from that point on, well, things have evolved very, very fast, right? So we work on concepts, right? So not only words, right? But the composition of words uh, into a hierarchy of concepts. Yeah. And they can all be coded as some form of vectors. In fact, in the recent technology, of uh, using um, transformers for machine translation, right? So you actually encode the, the meaning of the sentences in whatever language into a Latin space uh, where it is a language independent, but basically these different concepts or mental state, they are all coded up as vectors in that interlingual space. So in, uh, in addition to NLP, we can also look into other ways of decoding our mental states. Uh, I think these are all could use uh, some form of uh, machine learning algorithms. So I think there could be many exciting details if you go into these domains. But I think I, my story, uh, I should stop my story here. So I went on for a few projects uh, there. And most recently, that's uh, even more exciting development is that we are applying natural language methods to non-natural languages. So this is the, a story that we'll tell in the future, but this is my latest engagement. So now I want to get back to our starting point where we talk about AI and then there are many areas that we believe AI could continue or even um, uh, grow to excel. So we talk about automation, uh, knowledge extraction, and then complicated inferences uh, using big ensembles of evidences. And then uh, we want AIs to help us with rational and consistent and judgments in the decision-making, the critical decision-making, right? And then there are, as, as you can see here, there are many other ways AI can, can help us, um, including the fancier things, right? Like uh, generating of hypotheses and also creation of all kinds. You know, heard about music composition using AI, right? Creation of uh, visual scenes or images using AI, and there are many more coming. And I'm sure that as you go into this program of operations research, right, you'll be learning many, many of these uh, mathematical principles and method that could support many of this uh, continuing investigation in AI. Yeah and applications of AI into any of these domains that you may find interesting. No matter what your goal is, right? To pursue efficiency and to pursue automation, to reduce all this manual and, man manual and mental labor, or to make, just make life better for everyone, right? Yeah, or find new ways of to do, of learning or incorporating domain knowledge and then generating, creating and discovering. So I'm sure you will have plenty of opportunities down the road. So I guess uh, this is my talk. Uh, uh, I wonder if you want to go into some questions or so, yeah. yeah. Yes, thanks a lot, Tim. Yeah. So uh, great talk on the direction of Thank operational you. results and AI. Yeah. The students right. will be very motivated for the operational research program, mm -hmm. everything they have to learn here. We have some questions. Uh, yeah. I think uh, Leduino yeah. has projected there. Yeah. Someone wants to know about reinforcement learning. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, reinforcement learning uh, is a lot. I, um, I saw that uh, many of the users are in controlling uh, things, uh, controlling machines or processes. Um, and there's also um, in, in the internet, right, in e-commerce, right, people have also been using reinforcement learning. 
to take into user feedbacks and also to explore different options of like a web page design or something, right? And then they would use uh, this kind of methods to incorporate the user feedback in terms of maybe click streams or certain counting methods, right? And then they can use that as either reward or penalty to optimize their, their design options. So that is uh, some of the very popular uses of reinforcement learning. Uh, non-natural language. You really want to know what I'm working on. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. So this is no secret. Yeah, so uh, I'm working on, um, okay, think about natural language. What is language, right? Lang language is like a, a sequence of symbols, right, in any language. Now, now think about symbols that are not necessary a, um, our, our um, alphabet to mean a word or something. But what about molecules? So think about our DNA, think about proteins, uh, the chains of an, uh, um, um, uh, an amino acids. Uh, yeah, so that's, these are long chains of uh, sentences uh, made up of symbols, right? So this is one example of non-natural language, uh, but it turns out that many of the natural language processing methods are also applicable there. Now, Another uh, example is uh, programming languages. Like you may have heard about code generation. So you, you want to produce a Python program just by giving a few instructions to the producer. And this is another example. Right? In this case, it's artificial or programming language that, that the method is creating you know, or processing. So I'll give you two examples. Oh yeah, this is the same uh, the same question, right? Non natural language in using NLP. Yeah, I, I'll get you a, a little bit more about the methods, right? The generator is uh, one kind of method that we apply to that. So you and you can find quite a few publications already, yeah, in this area, right? Can you create a molecule to satisfy a certain property? Uh, can you design a drug? And you design a drug. <laughs> a drug is a molecule that you can create using that generator. It is like creating a sentence, uh, but you need to match a certain target, right? Yeah. In fact, drug discovery is very interesting. It's a lot like fitting uh, puzzle games. Uh, so you have a target which has a certain shape, <laughs> and you want to make a molecule that would fit in, right? Uh, think about the COVID, right? The coronavirus. You may have seen this picture, right? They have all these spikes, <laughs> look like a crown, right? So if you cover up the spikes, <laughs> then you'll be able to disable some function of this virus. Now, how do you design a certain vaccine that would enclose those spikes? <laughs> so that would be uh, part of uh, the pursuits of drug engineering, right? drug discovery. So. When reinforcement is learning, is better than traditional mixed integer. <laughs> well, all right, so I think the difference here is that whether you can take feedback, right? So reinforcement learning is, is all about feedback. Yeah, your, your, it's a iterative uh, uh, um, game, right? So you want to, you want to incorporate feedbacks in, in, in the subsequent rounds. Now, mixed integer linear programming, these usually are set up as uh, static methods, right? The fact that it is an integer just uh, constrain the decision variable, right? You cannot have fractional values on those variables. Yeah, and linear programming also, again, uh, defines uh, your, your objective function and your feasible region using linear constraints and linear objective function. So those are particular variants of a constraint optimization problem but they are not dynamic. Um, reinforcement learning is for a dynamical problem where you can obtain feedback from your in environment yeah. as you drive uh, through different states using your actions. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's in Portuguese, but it's some uh, something related to uh, citing applications in projects related to COVID, but you have talk a little bit about it. 
<laughs> oh yeah, I, I think you can you can find publications. So you can search for for drug discovery COVID. You, I think you'll find. Yeah, try to try to try to do online over stuff. vaccines and, and things yeah. like that. Yeah, and, yeah. antibodies, uh, vaccines. Or so yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, I have another question here. Do uh, you told uh, you talk a little bit about big data and small data? Uh, is are there small data problems in big companies today, or they are only concerned about the big data problems? Oh, there are all kinds of problems in a big company, right? I mean, said big data problems is one thing, small data problems and, not, and no data problems is yet a worse thing. Now, okay, big data happens, right? When you have a lot of, uh, well, with a lot of um, data that you need to process, then that, that, um, the challenge there is uh, a lot of machine power and infrastructure and your algorithm efficiency. Small data is a different kind of beast. Uh, small data, it actually appears everywhere. So you almost would never have enough data in many situations because uh, the data you need to confine a decision problem depends on how many variables are there, right? So if you have only one or two variables, perhaps right, a, few, a few thousand or a few millions <laughs> would be good enough. But if you have um, thousands of variables to optimize or to, to design or to, to take as, a, as a features, right? Even a million sample would give you a very small problem. So, so this is relative to the dimensions of the problem. And yeah, they are everywhere. So you, you will never have enough, I would say, even big data. Even when people think about the big data scales uh, in the context of the problem, you can still be a small data problem. So you can have both in the same context. It's big, the data is big because it's so much trouble to process it. But in terms of the constraints that it provides to the algorithm, it is still small. Yes. This is the problem of the curse of dimensionality. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, growth in reinforcement learning. We said, yeah, I think there's an opportunity for growth everywhere <laughs> if you take it into, into the context. Yes, I think so. I, I don't think the current research has exhausted all the possibilities, not even on supervised learning, I would say. So there are always new ways to characterize the, the, the domain, um, make the learning better, right? And, and But I think more importantly, I think there is a lot of work to be done on understanding the structure of the problem itself, right? And to know which kind of algorithm would apply well to which problem, right? So you heard about different variants of a reinforcement learning algorithms. Now, but what about the structure of the problems, right? So the chess game has a different structure from a Go game, right? And it also have a different structure versus an advertising uh, policy, right? So these are all different. Yeah. Now, would there be something that you can learn from the structure of the problem that would help you choose or refine a specific method? I think there should be room for people to work on. Quantum computing. <laughs> oh yeah, a lot of the quantum computing um, work is uh, now still at the stage of uh, designing uh, algorithms and also applications of those algorithms to, to different contexts. Um, I, I think we are hopeful. Um, I think even though we are not there, we're still um, early, I think in terms of the hardware development. Yeah, but I believe that at some point, right, we can get there. Yeah, just think about our our current computer, right, our, our silicon-based computers. <laughs> In the early days, it is not that impressive, but after a few decades, you see how the world has become. I think in in terms of machine learning, um, a lot of quantum algorithms uh, work on combinatorial optimization. So because uh, the way that they can they can trick a, a somewhat like a, it's a little bit like a parallel computation on the, the, all the possible states. So in some way, it gives you a vehicle to address uh, many of the combinatorial problems that we run into in machine learning. 
So I think if you look up the developed method, you will find many that are of this nature, yeah, trying to pursue, trying to transform the problem in a way that you can pursue many versions of it simultaneously. So, and then you want to convert that to a form that a quantum algorithm can handle. Yeah. I mean, improve uh, and a way to ontologies. Oh yeah, yeah, ontologies. We, we actually use that a lot. Um, uh, I think the most uh, uh, heavily, uh, the, the most heavily used ontology is the medical concepts. Um, in the U.S., uh, there is a big, uh, what they call the meta thesaurus. It is actually a big ontology or a hierarchy of medical concepts. Um, we use it a lot. We use it a lot to annotate the uh, different medical documents. Uh, yeah, personally, I, I worked with that for, for almost two, four years on a clinical uh, NLP project where we try to make a complex summary of some uh, clinical notes, right? Natural language text. Like the report that people write, uh, or that your doctors write, right? After he read your X-ray images, <laughs> or after he read your lab reports, uh, or after he sit with you for 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 maybe 15 minutes, uh, he's going to drop down a few uh, paragraphs of notes uh, after you go. Yeah. So those notes uh, need to be analyzed in some way. So to support better diagnosis decisions or treatment decisions, those uh, texts uh, that we can grab could be very useful. And one way to process those texts uh, would be to annotate them with the medical concepts because uh, that would convert those uh, very variable texts into some standardized terminology given by this ontology. So yes, I have seen you, that used a lot in, in the medical NLP context. Now in the broader AI, that is, uh, that's, uh, that's, there are other pursuits, uh, but I am less familiar with that. Yeah, I think people are trying, yeah, especially people who look into building uh, knowledge graphs or working on common sense AI. So I, I, I do see some uses of them. Which domains are most promising? <laughs> Good question. Um, I would tend to think that probably the the, the first ones that to 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 of real impact could be in transportation, right? So if you can make better uh, self driving, or maybe maybe not self driving, or more automated vehicles, or, or this kind of physical devices. Um, simply because I think the physical spaces are something more understandable, more controllable in some way. Um, yes, uh, people have used the reinforcement learning on, on e-commerce. Uh, yes, that, that would be possible, but, but I think they, uh, they, they have exhausted a lot of uh, possibilities. I'm not sure if you are going to have a huge, huge gain there. Um, well, but, um, but uh, in the physical space, right? So I think there are a lot of things that can still be done. And the current technology is very far from mature to be totally reliable. So if people are interested in that, yeah, I think that could be one promising direction. Yeah. All kinds of vehicles, not only cars, all kinds of vehicles. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Ching. Before, thank you for your great presentation. Thank you for attending. Yeah, really nice. Oh, yes. Thank you to have, for for the opportunity to talk to you. Yes, it was really really nice. We had about sixty seven people at a oh. time that was okay. looking at YouTube here. So our students are here and some more. <laughs> there are professors too and. Other people. Well, I, I should say that I actually started with, with this uh, discipline. Yeah, my first degree is in a business school. So I, I did a lot of quantitative classes there. I, I have a minor in applied mathematics, but operations research is really my, my first uh, set of uh, 
uh, algorithms to to be acquainted with <laughs> beyond the basic uh, well calculus and linear algebra. That's really my first domain. So so well, well that's where I started. So I say, yeah. Operations research and statistics. I think these two are really yes. you know, what what uh, enabled me to to have come that far. I say. Yes, they are the the basic, the basis for everything. Yeah, the basis for everything. Yeah. Uh, NLP and what to what? Yeah. 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 Oh. Because what kind? Oh well, just pick a. Uh, I think I, I think any of the modern NLP courses uh, would uh, introduce you through this uh, um, set of techniques. Uh, so word to word is uh, is uh, one of the first algorithms, uh, but since then uh, the field has evolved a lot, right? Um, and I think one of the it, well, it, people have done uh, machine translation, has done uh, reading and speech and all that with. Um, different kind of language models. But there are also other things like, like uh, chatbots, uh, question answering, and those are all, these days uh, are using a lot of those uh, semantic uh, vector methods. I think the recent generation methods uh, also use the uh, technique of transformers. Those are very deep neural networks um, uh, with uh, like uh, <laughs> stacks of uh, encoders, right? Yeah, and then you also have um, generators which have both uh, encoders and decoders. Yeah, think about these uh, interesting tools that you can find, right? So how how you can create a, a piece of text that look uh, totally real, <laughs> but is uh, actually created by machine, right? So those are also derived from these early methods, they, but they have evolved uh, since then. So. But starting with word to word, right? Try to understand how the word become a vector, right? What enables uh, you to do, right? So, what, yeah, using those vector representations. So, once you have this concept of uh, this type of meaning can be represented in vector space and can be processed using our familiar operations <laughs> research and statistical tools, then you'll be in the game, right? And then you can see how they, they become more and more sophisticated, but, but still in the variations of the same theme of representing meaning using vectors. <laughs> My student is inviting you right, to come. Thank you. thank you. I'll take that invitation. <laughs> thank yeah. you. I'll try someday. Yes, now it's come, winter come, here, come so it's... Too. Yeah. Visit me yeah, when you come to the US. Yeah, so. Yes, right now it's winter here. It's not very good, the weather. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's... Well, we don't have real winter here, so... Mm -hmm. But we'll manage to, to be able to bring you here someday yeah we'll try yeah we'll try for our project <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much it was a pleasure yeah. to see you again to talk to you and to yeah. hear you and your experience you are very motivating it was very motivating it was very interesting because we need to to show the students that that the basis they are having is useful for their careers in the future so it was really inspiring. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. And so we can um, in the future maybe we we will be able to bring you here to Brazil and to give the talk personally. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So yeah. thank you very much and okay. Have our yeah. good night here in Brazil. It's night yeah. already. I think in the oh, US. Yeah. yeah. Well. All right. So then uh, have a good evening then. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, again, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so goodbye yeah. here. Yeah.